Good day to you. Uh, this is the Fighting Men of Rhodesia YouTube series. My name is Tony Ballinger, and I'm about to interview Greg Ashton for his seventh talk, which is a record in the series. And if you'd want to know why seven, go back and look at the other six. They've all been very interesting, full of detail, and eloquently spoken by Greg. Uh, Greg, good to see you again. And um, like we've just been chatting off air, it's uh, hot and sticky over here, and it's cold and nippy over there but I'm sure in South Africa, but I'm sure we'll be able to get through the steam and, and the freezing icicles and come up with a good story. From one umdevo to the other, for those who don't know. <laughs> <that term. Umdevo. laughs> I've got to, I've got to go and get mine trimmed. Actually, there's um, some uh, Islamic guys down the road. They're the only guys who know how to, to cut a beard. I've been to other ordinary barber shops and it's come out looking like a lawnmower has gone over it. But these guys, they know how to trim it, and, and you know, it's uh, so I've got to go soon. Right, so what do we have for us today, Greg? I'm going to talk on two uh, early operations in my military career. Um, and this was actually a preamble or, uh, or precursor before uh, going to Rhodesia to, to be seconded to the SAS. Um, by late... Um, 1978, I was then a fully fledged um, uh, and qualified operator at one recce. And um, we'd been working with a number of the other regiments, which include five recce, which for those of you who don't know, very much the pseudo type operations, uh, like the Sulu scouts. Um, a lot of the uh, operators w were previous um, turned terrorists who fought on the other side. Um, and we had to spend a lot of time with them during our training to immerse ourselves in working in the bush. Now, I'm not being condescending to anybody, but our people would understand that somebody who lives in the bush, bush and is nature to the bush, particularly an African man or woman, um, seems to just embellish the ability of being a more capable bush person. If I can explain, somebody who lives in the bush uh, and is there every day and every day they are doing things out there, it becomes natural to them to see signs and to understand the bush and the bush sounds and the animals and the birds and uh, the terrain, which is not something that would be akin to somebody who's not from there. So it's not necessarily a white or a black thing. It's just where people are in terms of where they live. I mean, I know white men um, and women who live in the bush who are far more adept than a lot of black men who supposedly should know that uh, but aren't in tune with that anymore because that's not the nature of their of their lifestyle anymore so we worked a lot with the um the young soldiers from five recce um in the latter stages of the special forces selection course they did a dark phase um, and the dark phase was to orientate mostly white troops to get them to understand what it was like to be a black soldier and a black person who lived in the bush and came from those environments. So that was part and parcel of why we worked with them. Two Reiki, on the other hand, was the Citizen Force Regiment, um, very much like the territorials we had in Rhodesia, um, where people who had qualified um, as operators were then called up if they didn't finish any of the military commitments. Now, a majority of the guys in Special Forces, uh, well, let's say all of them, were career soldiers. There might have been a short-term contract, which was three or four years, uh, or something longer. At a later stage, they did try a citizen force um, or a conscript model. It didn't work very well. Look, they drew some good soldiers out of that who eventually uh, joined up and became uh, permanent soldiers as a career. Um, but it didn't work that well. But True Reiki was the means and the uh, and the uh, platform with which those people could be utilized on a territorial face, territorial based, rotational basis to go back and to operate um, and to be of value to the country. So late in 1978, we'd finished a whole lot of training. We had the guys from Two Reiki and the guys from Five Reiki in our base um, in the Caprivi, which is that narrow strip between Angola and Botswana. And um, the base that we were at, which was Fort Dopis, was right on the Kwando River, a massive river, a um, lot of islands and marshes in the middle of the river, 
Um, and great place if you loved animals. You had buck there called Lechwe, which are very unique to that particular area. You get them a bit in, in Kariba, as I understand, uh, although I've never seen them, but you certainly get them from all the way down on the Kwando down into the Okavango River. And then obviously it teams with game of all types. Now, Five Ricky had had an operational base just south of us, which they utilized more to train uh, a lot of their soldiers in. It was a little more secretive. And as alluded to previously, one group did not know what the other group was doing. Even within the same regiment, we had Alpha Group and we had Bravo Group. And we never knew what the other one was doing, primarily for security and secrecy purposes, uh, should anything happen. And this was the instance now leading up to the December period um, with Five Ricky having having training some people down there and they'd been involved in some operations where they'd captured some swapper terrorists. What they were doing is trying to glean as much information from them as possible uh, through interrogation. And I don't mean um, where they were torturing them or anything like that. No, just, just conventional uh, interviewing and, and uh, interrogation. And... Um, so what I'm leading up to is what then happened. It must have been around about the 15th, 14th or 15th of December, and why that date is particular. We had the 16th of December, which in those days was a, a national public holiday, and a lot of people were leaving to go back to South Africa, me being one of them as well. And on the 14th, I think the eve of the 14th, or the morning of the 15th, one of the uh, captured terrorists that... Five Ricky was uh, interrogating, escaped. Um, they got onto the radio to us at Fort Opis and said, this is the situation. This guy has escaped. He's an events, uh, immensely popular, not popular, valuable asset. In terms of the information that he's got, they haven't gleaned all that information from him because he's also a fairly high-ranking uh, soldier, or what rank I'm not entirely too sure, within SWAPO and... They were trying to get as much information as they could from him. They had some, but they didn't yet have enough. And he said he would share it with them later. So he managed to escape from um, um, the, the prison that he was held in. Now, this is a bush camp. So, you know, it was not, when I say not together, it was all the wood and things like that that you can uh, get from, from the bush where we were. The camp was right on the edge of the river, about uh, 12 or 15 kilometers south of Fort Dopis. And... Um, it's not concrete bricks and mortar and steel. It's all wood. And obviously he managed to get through the stockade that he was in, that he had been held in confinement in and he managed to escape. At this particular stage, we were all planning to depart to go to South Africa. So we would then drive to the closest uh, airfield, big commercial air, or commercial military airfield, which was in Mapacha, about 180 kilometers away. We were all packed with our bags and ready to go. The, the Corps came through for help. And um, I said, okay, I'm going to stay behind. I didn't have family or a girlfriend or anything like that. And there were a few of us who said, fine, we'd stay behind. There were one or two fire recce operators who happened to be in the base, and they said they would avail themselves. So we ended up with two teams of four, uh, two teams of two, not four, um, that were ready to go and track this guy down. And it's quite interesting. So he had gone from being south of us, gone around – Fort Dopis in a northerly direction and was going straight up through the Caprivi Strip, which is a narrow, I think in that particular area, it is most probably about 70 to 80 kilometers wide from north to south. And um, But he had a bit of a head start on us, uh, most, most probably around about six to eight hours. So they called in um, an Air Force Alouette and they divided us up in two teams. So what they did, they took two guys from one Ricky, which was a guy called Roy from Mark and myself. And then there were two operators from five Ricky, which they matched up with us. And you find in the bush combination, it often works quite well where you have two elements with different types of experience, put them in the bush and they work well together. So I was paired up with a very tall uh, gentleman by the name of Jermaine. Now Jermaine had come out of Angola. He'd been part of the Angolan civil war he, in fact, was a qualified dentist and had been married to a Swiss woman in Luanda. And when the war broke out, she'd been killed. And he was so angry uh, and hurt and frustrated with what had happened. He joined the FNLA, uh, which was one of the resistance groups in Angola in the early days, and then managed to find his way down to uh, it was a group called Brava Group, headed up by Jan Breitenbach and a lot of the operators that preceded us. 
um, then found his way down to uh, the guys at 32 Battalion and from there to Five Recce. He'd done the selection course and he passed. Well spoken, spoke English with a French accent, spoke French fluently. Tall guy. And, you know, if you ever look at um, men, don't look at other men as being handsome or good looking. But he was a handsome man. He had this dark, like, ebony brown skin. And he was about six foot four. And he was, you know, they always talk about the Greek god. And when he had his shirt, shirt off, he didn't look like you and me, Tony. He had the six pack and he had the bris, the nice white teeth and so on. And he was a nice guy and he spoke well and he was well educated. So I was actually quite glad to be paired up with him. I don't know the guy that Roy was, Roy from Mark was, was uh, matched up with, but we now had our a task in our hands. And our task was to catch this guy who had escaped. So people would say, why the helicopter? Well, the helicopter gives you the advantage um in terms of tracking so if you've got two teams sometimes they might even use two helicopters but we had one at this stage and they do something called leapfrogging so we were set out first from our base to go in a westerly direction to go and find the trail and um so we walking and we got dressed in like a patrol kit so very much like the the guys in the oral eye were out on patrol so we were in shorts t-shirts tackies uh our fn that we had with us uh, some rations, a lot of water because it's hot and dry, and a ground sheet or a sleeping bag that we shed between us. Cross grain must probably for about six or seven kilometers in a westerly direction, hit the spur and was going north. We turned right on the spur. And as soon as we got on the spur, we got onto the HF radio, uh, contacted the base, said we're on the spur. This is where we are. We had a map and we gave him our grid reference and we're going at this approximately this speed, which is most probably about eight kilometers an hour or so maybe a bit slower because of the fact that we were tracking. And what they would then do is contact the other team. So they got Roy and his guy, and then they flew up north ahead of us. They flew over us in the same direction, and then they went off to the left in a more westerly direction. It must be about a kilometer and a half or two from where they anticipated the track would be, and they dropped Roy and, and his uh, guy off. They crossed grain again, so they were going from a westerly to an easterly direction. And as soon as they hit the spur, they radioed back. We heard it. They said, we're on the spur. The, the guy's still ahead of us. You can see that he's running at this stage because once you're a tracker and you start picking up these things, you start picking up these things quite easily. Now, I had qualified uh, in my bushcraft tracking survival course in July and August the previous year. Um, I love the tracking component of our course that we were on. And um, the head of our, our tracking and training and bushcraft um responsibility within the special forces was uh dear Walter beer who was one of the founder members of special forces and um he liked my ability and he said i'd like you to be an assistant uh instructor on the next course which i was but i loved i just loved being out there and i wouldn't say i was a better tracker than Germain was but you could pick it up and you can see what the guy was doing and this guy was r walking running walking running and we could pick the spur up so we were cross graining so roy picked up the spur they came picked us up they dropped us ahead of him but this time on the eastern side we cross-grained um to the west and we picked up the spur and this is how it happened so very quickly you are able to leapfrog and to catch up with the guys i know for some people this is might be boring stuff but there's some people who don't know how this happens so we moving quite fast and then it was late afternoon thunderstorms came up it's a december time and um as it was starting to get dark the rain came down so what do you do? You can't move at night. You can't see anything. You're on the spur. So what you do in case, because you're also in enemy territory. Remember that. You're not You're not just uh, on home turf. Um, we went off the spur uh, in a dog leg um, formation around, and we came back to see where the spur was, found a place we could, we could hide in, and we snuggled up. Now, we're wet and sweaty from the day. We don't have much food with us, and we're lying together. I'm six foot, nearly six foot one. Jermaine is taller than me. We got soaked in the process. We got one ground sheet and one lightweight sleeping bag between us. So we're lying there and we're both shivering and cold. It's funny, you see. So we were spooning. Yeah, he had two soldiers spooning to stay warm. So he's lying behind me. Uh, and and I'm lying there like as my arms crossed on my side already like this. And you're not going to sleep very much. You know that in any case. And he says to me, Greg, I hate to tell you, he says, but you smell like a real munt. I'm not being derogative, but you're describing a guy who's been living in the bush for so long who smells. Now, you've been running all day, and you're sweating to high heaven. 
And this is what this guy says to me here. And now we're not having a chuckle in the bush. Anyway, we hardly slept that night. We were cold and wet. It stopped raining later. And um, there were animals moving around at night. We could we could hear and see them walking around. We could see some buffalo that had come past. And there were some elephants and so on. So, you know, the place is teeming with wild. Early the next morning, at first light, we were up. Um, we just... As I said, you stand to at first light or before first light to see if there's any, anybody or anyone else in the area. We're not going to be attacked by some enemy troops that might be in the area. We were fine. We said, fine, let's go. So we cross-grained and went back to where we were. And we couldn't really see the spoor. We could see indentations, but the game that had come across through the night and so on had walked across it and so on. And this guy was clever. He was following some other game trail. So game has a habit. It's like anybody else who's used to going to a place or walking in the park or in the garden, walk the same trail. We couldn't see anything. And we were ahead on the spur at this at sunset uh, when it became dark and it started to rain. So we contacted um, the base. They get the, got the helicopter. They took Roy and his mates and they flew up about four kilometers north of us um, on the western side so it could cross grain um, going in an easterly direction. We were now right on the Angolan Namibian border on the Kripivi Strip. And um, for people who want to know, is there a big fence or anything there? No, there's nothing between the two countries. There's a bit of an open strip. There's some beacons there, and you can see vehicles been driving down there, and it's a bit open. That's all there is. That's the border between the two countries. Same if you go south to Botswana. So it's not like on the um, on the Russian front when we used to go across the landmine uh, and the land uh, landmine fields there where there were fences and so on. No, there was nothing here. So we, we crossed over, and very soon uh, we got a message from Roy, and his guy said, we found the spur again, we're on the spur. Um, and now we were into Angola. So that's the southern part of Angola. There was unique activity in that area at a later stage, not then in 1978, but you could find uh, Swapo there, you could find MPLA there. Uh, we didn't want to run into any of those, so we're keeping our eyes open. This time of the year now, now is summer. So everything's starting to uh, grow, and it's nice and green. Under the big trees, especially like the uh, Mopani trees and the Rhodesian teak trees, it's it's quite open underneath, but there's a lot of shrubbery and greenery coming up. So your your field of vision is limited. In some areas, it could be as, as little as 30 or 40 meters, but you find that you get clumps of denser um, undergrowth. Then in some areas it opens up and you can see up to two, three, maybe even 400 meters under the trees like this, which is quite nice. And if you are trying to evade somebody, that's open terrain. You've got to, you've got to move. And this guy then realized he's got to spark. He's got to run. So he was running as much as he can. He obviously, he being a prisoner, he hadn't been fed that much. But I can tell you something. I come across, I came across some Swapo um, and other combatants that were our enemy uh, in the course of my uh, military career. And these guys are, they, they, they're built like weasels. They're lean and they're mean, and they're not necessarily big, but these guys are tough. Don't underestimate them. These guys are tough, and they can sometimes go for four, f four or five days with very little to no food. So we knew this guy was going to move, and he's light. He must be weighed around about 50 or 60 kilograms. I was weighing about 70. Charmaine is taller than me, so I reckon he worked. He weighed something between 90 and 100. Now, the heavier you are in the soft sand, the more difficult it is. Tony, I don't need to tell you that. So we we tra we tracking. Uh, Roy had found the spur. They came to pick us up. They took us further up um, over where Roy and his guy were on the eastern side. So we tend to have this pattern of cross-graining. So we were going east to west. He was going west to east. Further up, we cross-grained, pick up the spur. Now, the spur's wet from the night before, but it's nice. It's dry underneath, and you can see where the guy's gone. It's like drawing with a cokey pen on a whiteboard. It's so clear. You can see the spur in front of you, you know, up to about 50 or 60 meters ahead of you uh, when it's open. We also were aware at this stage that he's going directly north, and we would soon join up um, with, the with the Kwanda River, um, and the, where that part of the Kwanda River was, it would eventually cross over into Zambia uh, or join up with the border with Zambia. And it came down in a curve. So coming down from the north and then curving into towards the east. Um, and this is where we would, if we were going directly north, we'd hit the Kwanda River. We thought we were going to catch this guy. We really thought we were going to catch him because he went. And then um, 
Roy was the Roy and his guy were the last guys uh, to be dropped off again, and they were cross graining. They picked up the spoor and they said, "We can see the river. The river's close by. We think he's going to cross." So they brought it. We just carried on on the spoor. Uh, we met up with them, and on the river bank, we could see where the guy got into the water. Now there are crocs here, and there are hippos. So you got to be careful where you go. But I think somebody who's being chased is willing to take that that risk to get across. And we went across. It wasn't too wide. It seemed to be fairly shallow. We could see where the spoor went in, into the water. Um, we crossed over to the other side as well. We went through the water. We didn't come across any crocs. We could see the spoor on the other side, but now we were into Zambia. Uh, we didn't have authorization to really go over, but at least we, we could give a report of where the spoor was. So what do we do? Well, there's not much. So we were told to go back. The helicopter would pick us up and, and take us back to uh, Fort Opis, which was then about 60 kilometers, 60 or 70 kilometers south of us. So we'd gone a few days already, and we'd, we covered a lot of distance. So was it successful? No. But you know what? If you are able to give people information and as much information as they can, they can do something with us. So the guys at Five Ricky were quite clever. Um, there was a young captain there by the name of Charles Nordia, who I think had been responsible for this at this stage. He'd been one of the early, early members of... Um, or special forces, good soldier, good soldier at what he did. And so they concocted a, an idea, a counterintelligence idea. And so what they did, it took some of the some guys from Fire Ricky, which they dropped in by parachute at night, into the Zambian area where the guy had crossed over in. And why would the guy go to Zambia? Because he's Swapo, Southwest African People's Organization. Well, Zambia was the host to a lot of terrorists or um, anti-government organizations. I mean, if you look, Zipra, who was uh, fighting against the Rhodesian forces, they were also based in Zambia. Um, and the uh, ANC also were um, housed there as well. They were given a free board and accommodation, for lack of another term. So Zambia was friendly to a lot of these organizations. They were sympathetic. It was under the government of Kenneth Kaunda at that stage. So we thought the only way that we could... Um, try and catch it, capture this guy, <coughs> excuse me, was to set up a counterintelligence um, operation, sting operation. So the two operators from Five Rick who dropped in by parachute at night, they free fall in. Um, they went into the uh, area where they knew the guy would operate. They went onto one of the spurs. And one of the guys who had been in, who they had captured previously um, had died. He was part of this group, and they took him. They took him along. <coughs> Went up by vehicle that way. They took the guy across. But what the guys did is they made it look like um, an ambush, and they left the guy's body there. In those days, out in in the place where they were, they didn't have the forensics like we do today. So you could make the guy look like he'd been shot or whatever, which I think he might have been. And they scattered some documents. There, which looked like the, the documents that a lot of the terrorist cell groups would operate on because they operate in cell groups and one person writes a note from one person, hands it on to the next one, and then they hand it on to the next one. So that's the way they operate without radios. And what they were trying to say that their guys thought that the guy that we were chasing who had escaped was actually a double agent. He was actually working for the South African government in those days. We got news back about four or five months later. The guy had been captured by his own guys. He'd been interrogated and they dispatched him. That's the way it works. So, yeah. yeah. So sometimes your operation doesn't always go according to plan, but sometimes it then carries on. Mm. So I came home shortly after Christmas, spent a bit of, a bit of time here. And then um, I was informed that we, I was going to be part of a team that was going to be working with UNITA. Now UNITA was very much uh, the flavor of the, of that period of time for the South African government because they were anti-MPLA, which was the ruling um, government in Angola who supported SWAPO. Um, mm -hmm. UNITA didn't. And part of the role and responsibility of a special forces soldier or a special forces organization is to work with partisan forces, very much like the Allies did with the French resistance during World War II. A similar type of um, practice would be applied when dealing with partisan forces. And there were various organizations which were already doing some work, but they needed some boots on the ground, people with the experience and how to work with them, train them, and fight alongside them if need be. 
Um, so Roy was again selected. Another guy called Eldon O'Donovan, who's now passed. Um, Flip Marks, who uh, was uh, then a young sergeant, and myself. We were then seconded to CSI, which is Chief of Staff Intelligence. And um, very much like the BA BSAP's counterintelligence division, very much like that, and working with uh, counterintelligence and other organizations. So we were then um, seconded to CSI to work with them uh, and UNITA. So we were dropped in by parachute um, into the southern part of Angola, uh, where they had a small base that they were operating from. Generally, the CSI in that area used to drive in from where they were. They knew the area very well. That area was pretty secure uh, because um, you need to operate in the area. We didn't have much time. We could have driven that route, but it would have taken three or four days. They just said, we're dropping in by parachute, and this is what they did. So um, it was the early morning drop. It wasn't late at night or uh, in the in the wee hours. Um, and we landed on the ground, and we were met there with some of the, by some of the guys from CSI. We worked under the... Uh, guidance um, of the officer who was in control there, who then joined up with 32 Battalion later, a guy called Des Berman. I think he was the rank of lieutenant or captain, but he'd been well embedded with UNITA for some time. Uh, CSI had been working very closely with them. So the government channels and communication all going through CSI, then going to UNITA. So excuse me, any communication with Janice Savimbi would also happen at the higher level, but the lower level uh, where we were, this is what would happen. We went to the base close to where we'd been dropped, and there must have been four to 500 mostly male soldiers there. There were some women around, but in a support role, some of them were cooking. Some of them, I think, were from a nearby village that were there as well, which were sympathetic to um, UNITA. Our role was there to uh, help train some of the young soldiers that were there. Now, a lot of these guys are young recruits, which have just been... I wouldn't say press ganged, but um, being pushed into service. And if you think that you live in a little village in a country like Angola, there's a civil war going on. You tend to your crops and your cattle and things like that. There's not much going on. And the forces in the area, whether MPLA or UNITA, come and said, come, come, buddy, we want you to come and work with us. You don't really have much um, choice in the matter. And secondly, they're going to feed you. They're going to clothe you. So sometimes it's a a better option. And not that it was a conventional army like we know where they're going to issue you with kits and so on, but you at least get food and with time you get a rifle and you get boots and clothing and so on. So a lot of the soldiers that we came across were young, some of them 16, 17, and you can see them. They still haven't developed or haven't matured in any, any way whatsoever. And normally your age also denoted as to whether how much, how much clothing you had, if you had any. So a lot of them were still barefoot. Um, had cast off clothing, rag, bits and pieces of military gear and so on. <clears throat> and the really young guys still had wooden rifles that they'd been given to try and teach them until they'd been able to secure some more some more armaments and then they could obviously issue them uh, to them. And um, so when we got there, we were also given a Batman, which you would have known about, Tony, in those days. Um, and it's really a guy who's going to look after your needs and make sure that you get your food and water and things like that. And in this case, it was a young guy who didn't have a say in the matter. Um, I had a young guy, his name was Francesco. Uh, it's funny how you remember these names after all these years. And Francesco was was allocated to me. And uh, I, we never told him what the rank was, but he kept on referring to me as a capitan. Capitan. So anyway, that, that's it, you see. So Francesco was looking after me and my kit and everything else. Took me to where I was going to sleep, which was just a ground sheet under a tree. Um, with a top all and over it, just for me alone. And that's what we had. That's where we were. There wasn't much in the line of food. Uh, we had taken some suppliers with us, but you can only carry so much in your backpack. They said, no, um, Unita would be looking after us. So we would get some of the equivalent of sadza um, and some vegetables or some very stringy beef. And that was primarily our meal. So in the morning, we'd have sadza with very sour milk. Lunchtime, we'd have Sadza with something else, often beans or something like that at night time, a little bit of meat. And that was what we lived off. Um, our role was to train the soldiers. So we, we assembled all of the guys that we had to work with. There were some others in the area who were doing patrols that someone had gone off to fighting. We were left with the rags and tatters. I can tell you that. There weren't many of these guys around, but we had to put them into some fighting force. So over a period of two to three weeks, 
we had to drill them. So you drill them in the parade ground. And people say, but why? It's a soldier. Why does that person need to be drilled? You need to get some formation into them. You need to get some uh, discipline into them. So when you give a command, um, they know that it has to be executed, but how to be executed. So you start off your basic drill on the parade ground, which is under the trees. It's not open parade ground, still under the trees, just cleared underneath uh, because aircraft did fly over in the area. Um, and if any aircraft, enemy aircraft came over, everybody just went down to the ground, just stood still, aircraft would fly over, and then we'd all come up and carry on doing what we were doing. Then we went into basic uh, infantry training, so that's walking formation. We did a bit of fire and movement, and it's funny, the fire and movement we did, with, you have to do it like by numbers. So you give everybody a number, odd number, even number. So you get the guys, odd numbers, up, run three paces, go down, even numbers, up, run three paces, go down. So you get this fine movement thing going. Uh, dry, dry firing. No live ammunition at this stage because you don't know who's going to do what. So we were train, training these guys, getting them ready. Then we started walking patrol with them and doing all the things that you teach an infantry soldier. These guys had had no training before. So a crash course of three weeks is going to get them to some level, but they're not going to be experienced to be able to do anything. We were then told by Des Berman that we were going to do a base attack on a town nearby, which was then called Pereira de Ayrshire. Um, They changed it under the Angola, the new Angolan government and eventually what was called Onjiva. And it's pretty fairly, pretty much desert-type um, conditions, southern part of Angola. There are, there are some bigger trees, clumps of trees, and there are some streams, mostly dried-up streams, but it's dry country. Winter, it's even worse. It was summer now, early summer, uh, midsummer, and uh, we told we were going to attack the base. We said we can't do it. These guys are not ready. The, the first guys, the first enemy the combatants they're going to see, they're going to run. And we were told we had to go, we had to go. So we waited, and then we said, you got other guys in the area, don't you? And they said, yes. Can we bring some of those in as reinforcements? They said, yes. So they brought a few in, and some of these had been in some other skirmishes. So there were guys who were coming in that were limping, guys who'd had some uh, who'd been shot and sustained injuries from battle um, who weren't going to participate they were just coming back to recover but they thought we could possibly use them I said no we, we can't use these guys wait a little while longer and some more came in so we ended up with about I think about 80 or 90 of them which were more experienced we said fine we can then uh, consider doing this so we worked out a battle plan what we need to do how far to go because from where we were to where Pereira de Asia was was about 60 or so kilometers. Uh, I stand corrected. might have been slightly less. So between 40 and 60, so somewhere in that area. So at least it was a day or day and a half um, march to get there. So we got the guys ready, told them what we're going to do. We got all of our guys ready with our equipment. Time to go. We've got to take my backpack because I want all my equipment in my backpack. I want the extra ammunition we can carry. So we were loaded and, and ready to fight bear, as they would say. We walked for two days. Uh, late afternoon on the second day, we the scouts who knew the area said we were close by. We just had to uh, wait a while. We, there was a dry riverbed with some a lot of green bush and so on. They said we could sit and wait there for a while. It was late afternoon. And then what we would do, um, late at night, early hours of the morning, we would then go up to where the base was. The base was about three or four kilometers from us. We would then line up and do our attack, which we did. At about two in the morning, we start moving forward, and I was sort of very close to the front um, with the guys. We're walking in single line. It's in the bush. It's at dark. It's dark at night. There's no moon. Um, it's the only way you can move in the bush. You can't walk in extended military formation. We're sneaking up onto the base to attack them. And what happens? We come across a woman who's out there collecting wood. Um, capture her, hold on to her, and she's making a bit of a noise. So they. They covered her mouth and so on. And she's, no, I'm not going to do anything. What do they do? They let her go. What did she do? She runs straight back to the base. Um, so that was most probably around about three or four in the morning. Then we came across a little shepherd uh, who was herding some cattle. They did the same as well. Now, it's very difficult to understand. In in, in our circumstances, we would keep the person we, we, we captured, um, we'd keep them as hostage till after the the battle had taken place and you could let them go choose to do whatever you wanted to but a lot of these people came from the area so they felt 
Um, they had sympathy for the person that was there. That's why they let them go. I said, but guys, you can't do that. You know what they're going to do? It's like your sister. She's going to run home and say, mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, look, look what big dad, what my brother's done to me. It's the same type of thing. So we expected that our cover was blown, but we couldn't see any signs of it. So we formed up. We formed up on the south western side in extended line. We could see some thick bush, and, and through the bush we could see uh, the town and what's supposed to be a military base. It wasn't really a military base from what we could see, but we knew that there were a lot of troops stationed there. Um, there were MPLA, there were SWAPO in the area, and we had a suspicion that there might have been some Cuban advisors in the area as well. They might not have been in the base, but they would have been close by uh, because they'd been involved in training MPLA and SWAPO over the years that we operated there. Um, we had some extra guys we brought around to support us and they came on the southeastern side with the southwestern side so we formed a wedge like this we would move forward and they would also move forward in the same direction it was first light the light was just breaking like this and somebody one of the young recruits on our side accidentally fired a shot so the ad going off your surprise and cover is broken so we just said to the guys, Fogo, Fogo. In other words, fire, open up with fire. So the firefight ensued. So we opened up. Um, so we were mostly about 120 or so of us. It's quite a high volume of fire. And what did the MPLA and Swapper do? They opened up fire and they fired back. And it felt like a screaming match between two angry people yelling at each other because for the first two or three minutes, there was just this massive volume of high fire and they they were firing very high, which you always find in the bush. We were firing low. Uh, we were coming in over a bit of a rise into the base, but they were firing over us. The leaves and the trees above us weren't even being hit because often if, if they are closer, you shard under the leaves. They weren't, they weren't even hitting the trees. And there was a massive volume of firefight, as I mentioned. And the cacophony is so loud, you can't yell or scream at anybody like this. And what a lot of these guys do, they just put their rifle over the head and they just fire. That's all they do. They're not even looking. They just fire change magazines. A lot of these guys have never fired a full magazine because they don't have that much am ammunition. Now they were given four or five magazines. So they were changing magazines and just firing and firing. Eventually we tell them to, to stop, uh, cease fire, cease fire. And when I turned around, the guys who were behind us, who were our backup and so on, had all run off. That volume of fire scared them so much that they took off with all our extra ammunition, all of our kit and everything else. I had a, my Batman, Francesco, had insisted to be with me and he'd be there through the battle. We found him much, much later on, uh, a day or so later, still running with my backpack on his shoulder, on his head. That's how he was running because they, they didn't wear them. They like to carry them in their heads like porters. These guys had disappeared. So we only had the ammunition that we had on us at that stage, but we'd wa seemingly won the firefight. And we got up and we walked an extended line. We came to the base. And when you see an extended line like that of 120 people over a period like that, and they're quite heavily armed, I think it instills fear into anybody else. There were a few um, uh, pot shots that were taken at us from selective positions quite far away. And I'd say far away, three, 400 meters away in the open area we were going in. And we then started taking pot shots right at us. And there were two or three of us on, on the southwestern side uh, us white guys, and we had Black is Beautiful on, but at this stage, it was running and sweating and so on. Most of it had run off, so you could see we were white guys, and they were taking pot shots at us. Um, I suppose it's sniper, but I don't think it was a sniper. So I said to the guys, where is this guy hiding? And he was hiding uh, like a bit of a water tower, big drum on it, on a what had been a previous brick structure, but now it looked like a pile of bricks just standing there with some pipes coming out of it. So I said, anybody got an RPG? One of the guys in RPG, I said, can you fire at that and take it out? Fired at it. Didn't, didn't hit it, but hit right next door, and there was a massive explosion. And next thing, this guy jumped out and started running. Um, and he had a rifle with him, and I don't think it was a sniper rifle. I think it might have been an SKS or something with a slightly longer barrel rather than an AK, and he was running. So I took some pot shots at him, and what was I carrying? An AK-47. And with a guy moving like it, I'm not a great shot, but I can certainly, you know, take somebody down at 200 meters or something like it if you're on a rest or so on. And the AK is just not capable of doing that. And I said, has anybody else got a better rifle here? And there was a guy who had one of those old FNs 
with a, a different grip and so on in the front line. And I said to the guy, how does this thing shoot? He says, I'm the hunter. He said, this thing shoots very well. So I said, can I borrow it? I said, so I found a, a fork in a tree resting and I was trapping this guy. So this had transpired in a period of about, I'd say 10 to 15, maybe 10 to 20 seconds. So in 10 or 20 seconds, you can run quite far. But the guy was running across us. He wasn't running away. So I was just trying to follow him. One shot. I caught the guy in his in his hand as he was running like that with the rifle shooting off the right. Caught the guy in his hand. It looked like when you when you play uh, rugby and you grab a guy by his wrist and you swing him. And that's what that FN round does compared to an AK. It picks you up and it swings you around. Yeah. Um, and the guy was down, and we 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 went to see him later on. They would have to have amputated his wrist uh, or his hand, or they would obviously have to have bandaged and done some reconstructive surgery, which I doubt was an option. But I don't think he would ever be able to uh, use that hand very much at that stage. It's a pity, you know. I'm not saying I'm proud of doing this, but it's war and what it's about. Um, our brief here was to destroy any any ammunition we could find. And they had a big water reservoir with a water pump. It was run with a diesel uh, diesel engine. And our job was to blow this up. Only problem was the guy with the explosives had also gapped it. So what do we do? So we had some um, RPG uh, rounds um, that we could collect that had not been fired. And you got the charges below. So we took all of this and we tied it up. We had a little bit of uh, detonating cord or cortex with us. Um, I had a bit of PE4, and one of the other guys had a bit of PE4. So we strapped this all together around the water pump. Um, we withdrew uh, to a distance of about 200, 250 meters, and we detonated this thing. One of the RPG charges came firing right over our heads at that stage because it didn't explode. It, it went off the propellant, and it went off. But we did enough damage to that, apparently, to render it unusable for quite a few months. It means if you've got no water, you can have no troops. So it meant that they all had to, the troops had to pull out of that area until they could fix it up again. So that was uh, what we needed to do to get out of there. So most of the troops had left. We made sure that everything was done with the detonation and blowing up of the water pump. We, st we stood far back. We said the guys, they can move back and they can carry on. So now we've got to go back to the base. So we start walking, patrol formation with our kits and we're starting and next thing we start hearing, boom, boom. The um, Cubans had decided to come to the rescue. And they had some trucks with the 122 millimeter um, rockets on the back, the Monica Chito, as they would call them. Um, a great area weapon. It drives fear into the hearts of a lot of people because you hear it firing, but you don't know where it's going to go. And they were well over our heads. They're firing uh, uh, well over. They obviously realized they were firing too far, and then they brought their, their, their range closer and closer. So they were firing over our heads. We were running, and we were going to be running into um, where they were firing. Then they underestimated, and then they dropped them too, too short. They also had 82-millimeter mortars, um, which were then firing at us, and they were falling behind us, but they were catching up. So soon, somewhere between the line, we were going to get caught in the sandwich. And we thought they were ground-based. No, they weren't. They weren't vehicles. So they must have had gas trucks or something like that. And we could hear the diesel engines of the trucks behind us as we were running. We were running at this stage. It's semi-desert. It's white, whitish type sand, clumps of bush, and we were running. So we ran for 55 minutes, rest for five. Ran for 55, rest for five. And we did that for about four hours as they were chasing us. And you don't just run straight. You run a bit of a zigzag and you do this. And because you don't know where these guys um, are going. And we could see that they were behind us all the time, but they consistently were firing and they were behind us most of the time. And we got um, to the end of this <clears throat> dry air, desert like area to a dry riverbed. And then there was a steep embankment going up. And then the terrain changed. It was very different on the other side. So we got up there and we could see back and we could see in the in the distance, mostly about three kilometers, two to three kilometers back. A uh, number of vehicles were about five or six. They were still firing at us. They were, we were getting closer, but we knew we'd outrun them. So it's funny, we're sitting there now, we can see where they are. We've got an opportunity to rest a bit, drink some water, because when you're running like it, you, you're you saving your water as well. You don't want to drink it. And, and, and I know guys who really had been chased in operation, like in the Russian front, where they actually drank their drips because they had no more water left. Um, so we're sitting there. Ah, you're one of them too. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen what happens to those guys when they're dehydrated and they're suffering from heat exhaustion. It's not, not nice. Um, anyway, so we're sitting there and I'll... Fred Marks is sitting there now. He's in control of our team of guys, and he's looking at, looking at us in Afrikaans. He, he looks up to the guys. He says, guys, you know what I feel like now? 
a packet a packet of Russians and chips. <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, and he has this thing, a packet of Russians and chips. It's funny, I stayed with me forever. Anyway, we then um, moved at a rapid pace walking, and we got back to the base um, just after sunset. And yeah, all our kit and all the ammunition that we had to have in the battlefront was all sitting here all piled up with all the guys who'd run back. Um, they were a bit worried about follow-up, but because UNITA is really strong in that particular area, they had patrols out, and the patrols would just fire mortars at these guys and run sort of uh, small battle um, ambushes and so on. Um, <clears throat> MPLA wasn't going to come any closer. So we stayed on um, in the base for another two weeks, continuing our training with the youngsters there. But it was pretty dry at this stage. And my closing comment on this was, you know, people think it's all nice when you're living in the bush and as a soldier, you're going to go and get water. You're going to go down and you're going to go and scoop some water from the running stream. And it's just marvelous, you know. I remember on the second last day, walking down with Francesco, going to go and get some water. Because they used to go and get water for us and bring the water back every day. And, you know, you're drinking out of a water bottle. You're not really focusing on the quality of the water and so on. Sometimes you put a bit of grit in it and so on. So I walk down with Francisco and we come over this rise and he has this pan in, under some thorn trees and uh, there was a palm tree nearby as well. It's green. When I say green, like pea soup, green, yeah. green, green. And all along the side like this is cow manure and other manure from other animals because they stand in the water, they drink, they just defecate there <laughs> and so on. So I said, so where have you been getting our water? He said, yeah. Well, he's trying to disguise your disgust at that stage. What does he do? He weighs out into the middle of this pan, must be about waist deep. He wasn't a big guy. He must probably was about, um, I would say, four, four, four foot in terms like that. So it's about 1.2, 1.3 meters. He weighs out to about his belly button into the thing there, and he scoops the water like that. That water out there is just as green as it is on the side, just doesn't have any turds floating in it. Um, then we walked back to the guys, and the guy said to me, so what's the water like? I said, it's brilliant. It's this crystal clean fountain from which it comes on. I said, thank you so much. We were worried they were going to get it from one of the real old shitholes that they used to refer to it. But it was the green water. Anyway, you know, it doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. Yeah. And um, the day after that, we departed and we went back, so we finished our exercise. But it's just a little bit of an anecdote more so than any uh, military battle. Uh, experience and uh, stories to tell. So that's the end of it. Thanks, Tony. Oh, it's excellent. You know, um, you know, everybody or guys that haven't been in the in the military would love love hearing these stories because um, they've never experienced it and they don't know what it's like getting water. Um, in, with regard to that little anecdote, um, when I was on the Russian front, we ran out of water. We had drunk our drips. So we drank all the juice from our our, our cans of fruit and. Our tongues were out here, and it was like um, two in the morning, and the ground there was like this. It was undulating. It was up and down and left and right, and we were so thirsty. The African troops that I was working with came up to me and said, give us some water bottles each day. We'll, we'll go and find water. I said, you can't. You'll never find your way back. Anyway, they took uh, 12, 15 water bottles with them. They scurried off, and about four hours later, just before dawn, they came back and we glugged this water down. It was absolutely delicious. And then I thought, right, we've drunk all the water. We better go and get some more. I tell you, Greg, I cannot believe how far they went to find that water and get back at night without any GPS. I, I don't know how they did it. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, but yeah, I've also drunk from those green slimy piss and shit pits. And uh, we used to take our socks off and filter the water through that. I don't know which was dirty, our socks or the water. <laughs> foot and mouth disease, Tony. Yeah, foot and mouth. And then we'd pop out the old chlorine pill in or boil it for half an hour. But yeah, it's it's not a piece of cake. It's, um, it's there, there are no taps out there. Yeah, no, very interesting. And um, I guess even though you didn't catch that guy, it was a wonderful uh, opportunity to develop your skills, to practice things that you hadn't done before. Um the the one episode that you probably haven't watched yet, Greg, is just done recently. It was a, a guy who was on the dog section of the police in Rhodesia. Mm -hmm. And he was quite often deployed um, out into the bush on operational episodes. And he was just amazed at how efficient those dogs were. 
in keeping spore, even when mm -hmm. animals went over the spore, whatever, they just never lost the track. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it brings me to the question, did the SADF ever have dog sections that you relied on? I believe they did. I never, ever came into contact with that, but I, from stories uh, and reading, the stories I've been told and some reading I'm, I have done, mm. there were dogs that were deployed, but I think in limited areas because, you know, you've got to take care of a dog um, and particularly in the areas we were operating in, it gets very, very hot during summer, mm. uh, very little water, um, and um, it can be really difficult. I mean, the same with the, uh, equestrian soldiers uh, like the Grey Scouts that out there, some of these terrains where the guys operate on or operated in was so trying and tending on the horses. The horses really struggled. So I think within within certain limited capacity, um, they were certainly were utilized. I never came across them, but I know they were. Yeah, I think any area that had really high temperatures in the late 40s and 50s would have been very trying for them. Um, but the one thing I learned from that talk is that you'd also, also take two types of dogs with them. One that, that was very good at sniffing and tracking, like those long-haired mm. dogs, I, I forget what you call them. Um, they would follow the spore very easily, but then they were like puppies that go up and lick the turfs. So when when they were running with their noses off the ground, the scent was very fresh. Mm. And he pulled them back with a 60-foot rope, pulled that dog back, and then it let another one go forward that was the sort of hunter-killer or a couple of them. And they mm. would be very aggressive dogs, probably Dobermans or something like that, or Alsatians, and they would actually get into contact with them. But um, I think I think it would have worked quite effectively um, if more of those animals had been utilised. I don't know. It's you know it's a, it's something that people will debate. I'm sure. What what were your feelings when you walk in extended line into an enemy camp? Can you describe what was going on in your guts, your mind, your heart? Now, people think that because you're a soldier, irrespective of what soldier, but I'm saying primarily infantry, it could be the engineer corps, it could be artillery, it could be anybody because you often are in a situation where you are in enemy territory or you're walking into an enemy base. What do you feel? You're not impervious to fear. That's one thing I can tell you. Mm. Um, you are worried. And when you step into a place like that and having uh, later on worked uh, on the Russian front, where there are landmines and knowing our basic training where um, on a base you put mines out, normally the Claymore type mines or anti-personnel mines to stop people. This is what you're thinking of when you're stepping into that, number one. Number two, it's a perfect killing ground. Now, when you lay in ambush, the killing ground is the area where you've got designated arcs of fire mm. uh, and it's open. There's not much place for you to hide and you feel like an ant under a magnifying glass um, in an open piece of ground you really feel exposed. Um, and as I mentioned in this particular operation where the black is beautiful, beautiful is run off you, you can see your, your skin is white and your facial features are different to the indigenous people in the area. So immediately you do stand out. Um, so you are more vulnerable. Not that we need any different to anybody else, but you just happen to be the wrong color in the wrong place at that stage. And you do feel that any moment somebody's going to take uh, a shot at you or something is going to happen but you can't let the side down and you can't and especially if you in a senior or middle or lower leadership role you got other troops which depend on you and if you show hesitance or you show fear yeah. um, that fear breeds fear you can't let that happen so guess what your training has been good in fact ours was excellent and you know what you do? You do what you're going to do. It's like packing your sandwiches and going to work every day. You do exactly the same. So you get out and you and you go and do what, what you're supposed to do. You feel particularly vulnerable. And I can't say more than that. I mean, I've been in other situations where we've gone into bases um, where we've been shot at and you had to take cover. And this is what you expect. I've walked in extended lines where we walked into enemy uh, ambushes. And I wasn't hit. And in fact, on the one, I got a sliver of RPG uh, 7 shrapnel in my thumb. That's the only bit of, and I was the only person injured in that um, ambush we walked into. And there were about 18 of us. We walked into an ambush of about 10 guys. I didn't expect such a large group of us. But I think the automatic response that you have where you, where you are surprised and some people will go to ground and try and take cover. Our training was you immediately open fire and you go over into attack mode. That's what you do. 
So you are prepared for that and your adrenaline is pumping. So even if you're just walking through a, an, uh, through a base, an extended line where all the enemy is vacated, you still know uh, that you're vulnerable mm -hmm. because quite often the enemy would then regroup on the other side, form up, form an extended line. Um, their guys would uh, denote or mark out uh, arcs of fire or say, this is what you want you to do. And then what they would do, they would do, uh, an attack and attack the people in them. And this is what I was expecting when we went in there. So we were very careful uh, that something like it didn't happen. But we could see much further beyond where we were initially once we'd got into the base that they had vacated that left. They'd taken everything with them. So we, we were okay. But I've been in situations where we've gone in, done the attack, cleaned everything, thought we were okay, turned around, and next thing there's a counterattack which came back at, uh, at us. So you never for once take it for granted that you've won until everything is packed up, until the fat lady has sung and you've gone home. Don't expect that that has happened, yes. There's a couple of things that underpin a successful attack, and that's planning and also communication for foreign movement. Um, but with those guys, they were all sort of ex-villagers. They probably couldn't use radios if they, if they tried because they hadn't been trained. Um, how did you communicate um, with them, you know, go left, go right, or was it just a case of sticking to that V formation as you move forward? What we had trained because they didn't have those skills, we had, call them section leaders. So if you had in a platoon, you would have a section leader and then you would have your corporal, in, which you're normally like a corporal, if you're talking about conventional ranks or lance corporal and a corporal. Um, and then the sergeant would be in charge of uh, a platoon. And we tried to sort of follow the same. So you'd have somebody who either could communicate a lot better, was a bit smarter, and show the inclination and ability to be able to communicate and control the guys that were with him. Once at some stages, some of them might have been one of those guys in that little formation, but he was uh, more attentive. He was listening. He would respond, and he would then get his guys to move and so on. So that's what you do. So it's a bit like an organogram where you've got one person at the top and then flows down. So this is just inverted the other way around. So you've got the guys at the front with someone behind and someone behind. And so when you were giving instructions to walk forward, to prevent people from doing the wrong thing because they were not trying to do fine movement like we were where we did a buddy-buddy system, but you kept you guys in line. We would have to do even numbers, get up and walk, go down, uneven numbers, get up and go down. When you're going into base attack as part of the training, we just say to them, when you walk in, look at the guys next to you, and if you walk in a straight down, do not cross over with the other guys. And if you're in a V formation, don't walk across these guys because, remember, these guys have got – uh, things called rifles and rifles fire ammunition. The ammunition could hurt you. Um, and you do this. So you, you've got to be quite basic with them and get them to walk. And these guys behind them also have to make sure that they stay out, stay out, carry on walking, stay out. So you could hear the mumbling going on the whole time as you're doing that and walking for it. Um, this was more like a conventional attack. So it wasn't unconventional where you're going and you're going to attack and you're not making any noise or anything like it. You've got to control these guys. But uh, as I said, in this particular attack, all the support teams and all the guys with the ammunition and all the guys who were behind and a lot of the young recruits who had come in all turned around and uh, ran, you know, with everything that they had with them. So, you know, that that noise of that noise that comes with a firefight, especially intense like that, three minutes is a long time. Mm -hmm. I tell you, after that, for about two days, my hearing was still affected. I mean, today I'm partially deaf in my left ear, mm -hmm. but from a lot of that exposure, the same thing happens. So mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. No, very, very, very good. And and just the last question, I think, is um, what would you do for evacuating the wounded in that situation? You'd have to carry them. Did you have allocated medics? Uh, if I remember from your talks, you you were quite well trained as a medic yourself, weren't you? I, I was. Um, I, I'd done my basics, uh, my basic and my advanced medical course, but I was certainly not the group medic that I became later. And, yeah, you could, you could staunch... Um, you know, some injuries. So you could do something with somebody um, had uh, experienced an injury like uh, shrapnel from mortars and so on, which had gone down deep and had severed arteries and so on. You could do a thing called a cut down where you have artery forceps, you cut down and you clamp it off and then you bandage up and so on. I could do that. Mm -hmm. Not that I was had the big medical kit with me, but I had some of the basic stuff. But every one of us carried a drip with a sausagon, as you would know, yeah. um, and some of the, and a lot of bomb bandages. So you could, you could do the essential, but if somebody got injured, they'd have to be casavac and you'd have to make a, a stretcher. So you have ground sheets, put poles through it and carry the guy. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any injuries. We were quite fortunate in this particular attack because mm -hmm. to carry somebody back 
anywhere between 40 and 60 kilometers. Um, it's a long way to go and to carry somebody like that. And quite often, um, that person might succumb to their to their wounds. They, they might not make it, you know. They've missed the golden hour. Yeah. Yeah. Greg, fascinating talk. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, uh, this coming Saturday, for the viewers looking in, I'll be interviewing General uh, General Roland de Vries, uh, second in command of the South African Defence Forces. I'm going to be plying him with all sorts of questions, um, particularly about South Africa's capability in the conventional war. Uh, but also, he commanded a lot of troops that fought in Rhodesia, so that'll be a very interesting aspect of the talk, and I really look forward to that. Um, Craig, thank you. Uh, I don't know if there's an ad story in you, but if there is, uh, start planning. <laughs> As I say, watch the space. Okay, excellent. Thank, thank, you, thank, you, thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, thanks Greg. Take care. Eh?